Hello, this is Adam again, and today we're going to be talking about the first section in rheumatology. This will mainly be covering uh, a little bit about uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I'll also talk about some things uh, in regards to osteoarthritis and whatnot. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. First thing we'll talk about uh, is just to make sure we all have a uh, kind of similar background on the immune response. So we know that the immune response uh, is going to be occurring whenever there are immunologically competent cells being activated. Uh, typically this is in response to either foreign or uh, antigenic substances. This could be things like former pro, uh, foreign proteins and, and things like that. Um, and typically what we see is that, you know, acutely they can be a good good process, but chronically um, the effects can be pretty deleterious, especially if there is no resolution of the underlying process. Um, it's going to happen chronically, especially with patients like with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, and all sorts of, sorts of other um, autoimmune disorders. Uh, we see that with uh, chronic inflammation, there's going to be a release of many different types of cytokines and chemokines, uh, and there's a lot of different interplay that's going to happen with the different immunoactive cells. And I have a few pictures to kind of um, illustrate that. So this kind of chronic inflammatory process is really where we're going to see the source of a lot of these autoimmune dis disorders like RA, uh, vasculitis, uh, lupus, and, and even gout to some degree. What's going to be occurring is that there's going to be some cell damage from the inflammation. Um, when this happens, there's going to be a lot of release of um, leukocyte lysosomal enzymes. We know that these enzymes um, can be uh, have some damaging effects on, on neighboring cells. Um, we also know that arachidonic acid is going to be deliberated. Uh, I know we've talked about this previously when we've talked about um, anti-inflammatory agents, um, antiplatelet agents, and even uh, we were talking about asthma. Um, specifically with asthma, we see that they have the lipoxygenase pathway. That's where we had our leukotriene receptor antagonists like Montelukast. Um, but specifically, this lipoxygenase pathway is going to be producing leukotrienes. Um, this is going to be chemotactic to eosinophils, neutrophils, and macrophages. So there's going to be a lot of different immune cells being brought in um, to deal with this um, whatever the, the body has, has identified as being foreign and needs to, to attack. Um, these eicosanoids are also synthesized during this process. Um, and also what can happen here is that with neutrophil stimulation, we have a lot of free radicals being formed. So these are reactive oxygen species, things like H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide that will break down. Um, and these can be very damaging to um, cellular proteins, cause them to, to um, have deformation, uh, can damage DNA, and, and basically induce uh, apoptosis. So this process of having these free radicals around that are going to uh, kind of propagate further inflammation just uh, has a perpetual cycle. Um, and this is where that chronic inflammation really uh, steps in. So again, looking at this process here, you can see um, that at the top we have the cell membrane phospholipids. Um, we're going to have a lot of phospholipases uh, liberating things like arachidonic acid. Um, here you can see that um, things like, hopefully you can use this laser pointer here, um, steroids are going to be able to inhibit this process of liberating the more arachidonic acid. Um, on the left side here with the lipoxygenase pathway, um, this is where our, most of our leukotrienes are being formed. And again, they're going to be able to um, have kind of this chemotaxis um, type of capabilities to draw more inflammatory cells in. Um, a lot of these uh, leukotrienes are responsible for things like vasoconstriction and bronchospasm uh, and also increased uh, vascular permeability. So again, we can see where that process was really important for um, asthma and blocking these effects um, were beneficial to those patients. On the flip side though, um, from arachidonic acid, we go through the cyclooxygenase pathway, the COX pathway. Um, as we remember, we know that COX-1 is going to be uh, uh, one of the constitutive COX enzymes which are really important for normal homeostasis, whereas on the other hand we have COX-2 um, that is going to be more of the inducible type of cyclooxygenase. Um, when you have a site of inflammation, this is where you're going to see more COX-2 being uh, formed. And we know that COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors, like the um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also things like aspirin are going to be able to kind of inhibit the cyclooxygenase pathway. Um, if this is left to go 
go uh, without being stopped by some of these medications. We'll see um, that not only prostaglandins being formed, but also things like thromboxane, so which can cause uh, platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction will occur, and also with prostacyclins being formed, which will cause vasodilation uh, and actually will inhibit uh, platelet aggregation. We'll see um, where uh, inhibiting one type of cyclooxygenase enzyme versus another can lead to some issues, um, especially with leading to more having more on the thromboxane side of things, which can lead to um, uh, thought to lead to premature cardiac death. Okay, so our first thing we'll be talking about here is going to be rheumatoid arthritis. And as we've mentioned, it's a chronic inflammatory disease um, that is typically going to be characterized by the symmetrical joint involvement. And there's a lot of extra-articular manifestations that can occur, uh, especially with more long-standing chronic disease. Um, one of the things that we do see is that uh, typically females are going to be more uh, predominantly affected by RA. Uh, we know that the onset is typically a little bit later in life, so 30s to 40s. Um, not that that's late in life, but uh, definitely past the uh, early adulthood stage. Um, again, this is going to be diagnosed mostly based on clinical features, and, and typically we'll have a variable course and progression, um, especially when we are utilizing some of the medications we'll talk about a little bit later. And essentially, what's happening here is that, uh, especially in the earlier stages, you're going to have uh, mainly joint destruction that's occurring, um, and that's beginning with the inflammation of the synovial lining. This chronic uh, inflammation of the synovial tissue lining the joint is going to eventually lead to this capsule, uh, and, and the inflamed synovium is going to uh, get this new term called a panis. And basically what this is going to do is to invade the cartilage and the bone surface, which leads to basic uh, erosion and destruction of the joint itself. And the problem here is that the immune system is really not determining um, what are foreign antigens and what are what would be considered the self. And so this kind of unchecked inflammatory process leads to a lot of self-damage occurring um, by the immune system. So what's happening here is that there's a humoral component to uh, RA in that we have the formation of antibodies that are derived from these uh, B lymphocytes. These rheumatoid factors, um, which are the antibodies, uh, basically are non-pathogenic. Uh, um, and, and what we see is that the quantity doesn't really correlate with disease severity necessarily. Um, and then we also have the generation of this, uh, this ACPA, these protein antibodies, uh, which will be found uh, and important for diagnosing um, uh, the disease itself, you know, aside from just uh, physical exam and history. So these B cells are going to be producing uh, antibodies. Again, those are the rheumatoid factors. And, and in conjunction with the complement system, the antibodies are going to be able to attract these polymorphonuclear cells. These are like things like your neutrophils. Um, when these get attracted, they're going to start attacking uh, the, the cell material uh, and start to release things like the cytotoxins, the free radicals, which will go on to propagate um, further inflammation. Uh, and, and basically all this does is promote cellular damage um, that's going to be happening here. Um, not only that, but they're also going to be able to act as antigen presenting cells to activate the T cells as well. T cells are going to be relying on direct cell to cell contact, um, and when they are being activated, they're going to start to release other pro inflammatory cytokines, further propagating the inflammation. Uh, this will include things like tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, interleukins. And when this is occurring, we're also going to start to see production of things like the histamine, kinins, and prostaglandins. So this is where you're going to see a lot of warmth, edema, and erythema that are developing uh, around the site of uh, inflammation. And the CD receptors are going to be, again, these are found on the T cells, are going to be important for the cell-to-cell -cell signaling. Um, and we'll actually see where there's a number of drugs that are going to be really important um, for blocking um, the effects of these CD receptors. Um, these are going to be some of our... Uh, biological products. We'll see they're specifically targeted for the, the CD receptors. So again, just a picture to kind of give you an idea of um, what's going on during this process. So we have the plasma cells um, releasing some of these autoantibodies. Um, again, we're going to have our B cells being able to kind of activate these APCs or antigen presenting cells. Um, these are all going to be activating our T cells. So, and this is where you see a lot of these um, inflammatory cytokines, like your interleukins being produced. Um, 
when, while this is happening, you're going to have things like your activated macrophages and whatnot, um, leading to uh, destruction of the bone, uh, bone matrix being uh, worked on here. So again, kind of a, uh, a self-perpetuating cycle um, leading to damage to the joint itself. Just another picture here to kind of give you an idea of what's happening. Um, you'll see here we're going to have bone and the cartilage, um, the joint here, and then this is the that inflamed synovial lining, the pandas here. Um, and again, lots of different cells that are interacting with one another, but basically they're all kind of working together to help propagate this inflammation uh, to occur. So looking at the joints that are going to be involved with rheumatoid arthritis, um, we're going to see that small joints will be affected um, primarily. Uh, we're going to see the hands, wrists, and feet, um, but this is not going to be exclusive to these, as we'll also see things like the elbows, hips, and knees, and, and larger joints being affected as well. Um, one of the key differentiators between RA and osteoarthritis, or OA, um, we'll see that the joint stiffness is typically going to... Um, usually persist uh, throughout most of the day, especially with more severe disease, um, but will certainly exceed 30 minutes, um, usually with uh, other forms of um, joint involvement, you know, especially with OA specifically, you're going to see um, some of that joint stiffness kind of go away um, after a period of time, but here it's going to be persistent. Um, when this is happening, we're going to see decreased range of motion and chronic pain associated with it. And basically, the, the big thing that is uh, going to be happening here is a decreased ability to perform a lot of their daily activities. Um, we all know that that leads to lots of downstream effects, um, lots of, of issues with um, you know psychological stress and, and things like that from not being able to really um, perform like they uh, used to. Um, so we'll see a lot of um, kind of comorbid conditions kind of creep up uh, surrounding this. Just a, a nice picture, I thought, that kind of compared rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis. Um, so looking here with RA on the left side, you'll see the small joints here being affected more commonly, um, whereas with um, osteoarthritis, you're going to see a lot more things like the knees, the hips, and the back, uh, neck as well being affected. Um, again, these are kind of more related to just kind of chronic wear and tear, um, whereas here, again, this is going to be more of a, this autoimmune um, type of condition affecting the RA patients. Some of the other manifestations that we'll see with RA, um, you're going to have some of these nodules that are forming, um, usually are asymptomatic, uh, but they can develop in certain areas like the long or pleural lining where they can cause further problems. Um, we'll also see, again, because they have this kind of chronic inflammation occurring, we can see vasculitis is starting to form, especially at the end of um, you know, the appendages, especially at the fingers and toes. Um, rarely we see ocular uh, manifestations. Um, this is related to inflammation of things like the sclera and the cornea. And, and even in some cases, you will see cardiac involvement. With osteoarthritis, and I just use this as a point to uh, kind of differentiate the two, we see that this is definitely a more common form of joint disease. And it's typically going to be uh, later in onset than you would see with RA necessarily. Uh, affecting more middle-aged and older patients. Um, we know that you know, there's estimated 27 million Americans are going to be living uh, with osteoarthritis, and it's affecting nearly half of those patients who are greater than 65 years of age, and, and practically everyone over 75. Um, lots of risk factors associated with it, including things like age and obesity. Um, occupation can be a big thing, especially if there's lots of kind of repetitive, um, repetitive stress type injuries, um, but there can also be things like genetic factors as well. Um, and we know this is big business for surgery because we have lots and lots of knee and hip replacements that are occurring all the time. Um, uh, we'll actually talk more about this uh, a little bit, especially the um, prosthetics and whatnot when we get to the um, orthopedic section. Looking at um, osteoarthritic uh, joints, we can see here uh, that this normal joint has normal synovial uh, fluid. Um, we have the bone and the cartilage and, and really there's not a whole lot of contact happening here. But over time with osteoarthritis as that synovial lining kind of wears down, um, you'll see that there's actually just bone on bone contact um, happening. This is where a lot of the pain and a lot of the disability comes from um, uh, from this perspective. On the other hand, with the rheumatoid arthritis patient, you're going to see uh, these joints um, not necessarily uh, as degraded on the on the cartilage and, and 
there's not really so much bone to bone contact happening here, but really just a lot of inflamed uh, synovial lining, uh, very swollen, um, linked to the kind of very large kind of joints um, that you'll see with some of these patients. So again, our rheumatoid arthritis is going to be affecting more of the small joints of the hands, uh, the feet. And some of the other things that we can potentially see with these patients um, include things like this mallet finger, um, this uh, boutonniere deformity, uh, and the swan neck deformity that can occur. So again, these can be chronic and the patients may not be able to kind of relax that, um, which can lead to you know, decreased mobility and, and inability to kind of um, partake of their normal daily activities. And kind of just another picture showing how some of these manifestations uh, can occur. And again, this would be more of a late stage patient uh, with a lot of uh, deviation of the fingers here, as you might imagine, be uh, both painful and difficult to um, kind of do your normal activities. Um, in comparison to that with osteoarthritis, Uh, we'll definitely see that obesity is going to be linked a lot more to um, knee osteoarthritis, um, uh, definitely more so than, than hip osteoarthritis, um, but we'll also see here where a lot of occupation, sports, and trauma can be um, related to, to development of osteoarthritis. So again, a lot of repetitive motion injuries, um, traumatic injuries, and all these things can kind of increase your risk for, for developing this. The pathophys for osteoarthritis as compared to rheumatoid arthritis, um, again, is going to be mainly due to articular cartilage damage that happens over time. Again, injury, stress, general wear and tear is going to be happening here. Uh, and this breakdown in the cartilage process um, actually leads to some apoptosis of the chondrocytes. Again, apoptosis being the, the kind of program cell death. Um, because of this loss of cartilage, you're going to have joint narrowing, and this is where you kind of get more of that bone-on-bone -bone contact. So it's much more of a mechanical issue than it is necessarily a, um, an autoimmune type of issue. You still get an inflammatory response with osteoarthritis, but it is not as self-propagating uh, as you would see with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and the pain is mainly going to be due to this activation of these nociceptive nerve endings um, when you have uh, the joint being affected by these mechanical and, and, and chemical irritants. Again, looking at a normal uh, joint here on the left side, um, again, regular normal bone texture here. You can see these things are going to be kind of breaking down and, and becoming remodeled uh, over time. And again, here you can see the, the synovial fluid is just not going to be uh, the joint itself with the cartilage is, is just not going to be um, well maintained. It's going to be breaking down over time um, and become uh, much less functional. So again, with the presentation of osteoarthritis, uh, you're going to be expecting to see a lot of deep, aching type pain, um, certainly limitation of motion um, the, and the, the effect of joints, uh, and joint stiffness, um, which will typically go away um, in the morning time, usually you know, around 30 minutes or so. With more use, um, the, the joints will end up getting better. Um, you have crepitus, local tenderness, um, some joint enlargement, um, usually something you see a little bit later on in, in, um, in these cases, uh, and also potentially even radiographic changes. So again, just kind of looking at these joints here, um, you see the, you know, definitely the hands can be affected, but really the, the hips, knees, neck, back, those are really going to be the the bigger joints are going to be affected as opposed to um, rheumatoid arthritis where there's a lot more of the smaller joints. Uh, so again, just kind of comparing the features of RA and OA and, and I'll uh, show you guys in a little bit why we're kind of comparing these two because some of the treatments will be similar, um, but it's important to know which treatments would not be appropriate for, for each one. Um, so again, looking at RA, the morning joint stiffness is generally going to be persistent. Um, especially in the morning, uh, OA, it will generally go away with, with some use. Um, again, we'll return with, with the rest of the joint. Um, again, pain mainly becoming um, with um, more with use on the OA side. Uh, pain's going to be more persistent with, with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, OA is generally going to be affecting fewer number of joints, especially the ones that are being um, 
you know, if you were in a position where you're getting lots of knee injuries, say due to sports or something like that, of course those are going to be affected. And why would your hands be affected necessarily um, if you, you know, if they were not being overused in the same way? Um, whereas with the RA, because it's more of a systemic inflammatory issue, you can see uh, many more joints being affected. Uh, and then when the inflammation in RA is always going to be present, because again, this is really the underlying um, cause for the disease versus in that way it may or may not be present. Again, looking at the joints that are involved with OA, it can be asymmetrical. With RA, typically it will be more symmetric. Um, and again, going to those um, findings of inflammation uh, with RA, more likely to see things like increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate, uh, rheumatoid factors versus OA, obviously would not be seeing any of those. Um, and then with uh, the extra-articular systemic effects, um, they may be present with, with RA, but especially with the more long-standing RA, um, you, you may be able to see these more often, but more typically are absent with OA. And then uh, x-ray changes are generally going to be uh, absent in the early stages with RA, but with OA, um, generally going to be present, especially the more um, pronounced the disease becomes. So, uh, getting into therapy. So the goals of therapy for both RA and OA uh, are going to be to help relieve pain and stiffness, like to reduce inflammation, um, more if it's present in OA, but definitely with with uh, with RA. We like to improve joint function, as a quality of life, and then slow the joint joint damage. And we'll see with um, especially with um, RA that disease progression is going to be one of the big um, focuses for a lot of the medications we use. Um, again, with uh, RA, we'd like to see remission of symptoms, and again, that slowing of the disease progression is going to be really, really important. So looking at non-pharmacologic therapy, we always like to focus on um, uh, physical and occupational therapy uh, when we can. Again, this is a good, good, good cornerstone to therapy, um, including things like joint manipulation, stretching, pool exercises, um, weight loss, especially with uh, OA is going to be very, very important, um, and potentially even things like assistive uh, devices like moist heat and ice. Uh, of course, rest is always going to be important, especially if you find uh, flare-up of symptoms with um, more with use of the joints, and then potentially surgery. Uh, this is going to be more so with, with osteoarthritis and with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so comparing the pharmacologic therapy um, between these two, so RA and OA, um, we're going to see that certain drugs may be utilized for both disease states, but we'll find that there's a lot of drugs that are more utilized for one versus the other. So with chronic treatment with rheumatoid arthritis, we're going to see that anti-inflammatories would be very useful. So um, this is where we're talking about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs. Um, this is where we also see kind of chronic low-dose corticosteroids. Uh, on chronic treatment for osteoarthritis, we're going to be seeing uh, things like acetaminophen are going to be much more um, utilized here than you would see necessarily with rheumatoid arthritis. We'll see NSAIDs being used as well, um, and then potentially even the utilization of certain topical analgesics uh, for local pain. Um, as we remember from some of our earlier lectures, that uh, topical treatment um, is, is utilized for a number of reasons, but mainly because of the fact that it eliminates um, change for a lot of systemic toxicity in most cases. Um, and so, you know, if you only have your left knee is what bothers you, why not just apply an analgesic to that area rather than treat the entire body? For acute exacerbations, because rheumatoid arthritis is much more based in uh, inflammation than it is in, in osteoarthritis, corticosteroids or kind of pulse dose uh, steroids are going to be much more um, utilized for acute exacerbations. Whereas with osteoarthritis for acute flare-ups, um, this is where, you know, if our acetaminophen and our NSAIDs are failing, this is where we kind of bump back to opioid analgesics. So as far as disease progression goes, um, some of the things we can utilize uh, for RA are going to be these DMARDs, and these are um, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Uh, and those will fall into a couple different categories, which we'll mention in just a little bit. Um, and then for the specific uh, joints, um, especially for knee effusions, um, this is where we can see utilization of things like aspiration, and you can also have corticosteroid uh, injections uh, into the joint itself to help deal with uh, local inflammation. So for the RA pharmacotherapy, the, the biggest category of drugs that are kind of new to us are going to be the, the DMARDs, or the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Um, you'll find that they fall into one of two categories, either being uh, biologic or non-biologic. 
these are really the cornerstone of therapy and should be initiated as early as possible. Um, they find much more favorable outcomes uh, than if you were to start later because, again, these are going to be really useful for um, halting the progression, maybe not halting, but slowing the progression of the disease um, rather than just treating the acute symptoms. Um, things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and corticosteroids provide more immediate symptomatic relief um, because, as we'll see, these DMARs take a while to kick in, and in a lot of cases, but um, corticosteroids and NSAIDs are going to do nothing um, to slow down the joint destruction that's happening or, or to slow the kind of the extra articular um, effects that can happen from RA. So DMARs are very, very important for helping to slow this progression down. Some of the traditional DMARDs we'll see here include things like methotrexate. Um, you guys will remember methotrexate as being a, a folic acid antagonist um, from your chemotherapy lecture. You can see it's also being utilized here for rheumatoid arthritis. We'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. Um, but also some other drugs like hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, and also leflunamide are, are more kind of old school traditional DMARDs. Then you have your biological DMARDs, and so these are typically going to be uh, protein-based products um, that have been synthesized specifically specifically against a um, one of the factors of inflammation um, in that whole cascade that we alluded to before. So we'll see that uh, we have a few agents that are going to be anti-TNF or tumor necrosis factor. So these are proteins that are specifically designed to bind to TNF and inactivate it. This is where we'll see use of uh, infliximab, etanercept, and adalimumab. Um, again, I will be the first one to admit that these, uh, some of these uh, monoclonal antibodies are very difficult to say. Um, and then we also have some co-stimulation modulators like abatacept or orencia. We have an IL-1 or interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. This would be anakinra or kinneret. And we also have interleukin-6 receptor antagonists. So this will be uh, like tocilizumab or actimra, and then rituximab or rituxin. Um, again, rituximab being one of those ones we've seen before utilized for chemotherapy. Other agents that you might see being utilized, uh, maybe not so often. Um, you certainly may see some of these uh, being utilized um, for other types of autoimmune conditions. I've certainly seen things like cyclophosphamide being utilized for like lupus nephritis, things like that. But for rheumatoid arthritis specifically, these agents are um, less often used. Uh, most of them are going to be kind of your traditional um, DMARD. So things like azathioprine, which you may see utilized often for prevention of rejection of a transplanted organ. Um, so it's good for transplant patients. We also have old, old agents like D-penicillamine, which is uh, structurally related to penicillin, uh, gold-based compounds. Um, so you'd actually be able to utilize um, gold as a uh, disease-modifying drug. Um, cyclosporin, again, another transplant drug. And then, uh, of course, cyclophosphamide, um, which we remember from our oncology lectures. So we don't fully understand the mechanism of the DMARDs. Um, we know that they're utilized to help to kind of tamp down the, uh, the inflammatory response that's happening here. Um, but beyond that, we don't necessarily know the full mechanism. Um, we do know that methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine have pretty much the best efficacy to toxicity ratios. Um, and fortunately, we've seen in certain studies that methotrexate plus uh, low-dose corticosteroids um, are able to be continued by greater than 50% of patients for five years. So these drugs will be effective for a period of time um, and are relatively well tolerated. Um, keep in mind that you may need to combine multiple DMARs depending on the progression of the disease. And we'll talk a little bit later about which ones it makes sense to use together and which ones it does not make sense to use together at the same time. Um, so that's kind of an important point. The traditional DMARDs generally have a slow onset of action, around three to six months or so. Um, with methotrexate, sulfasalazine, or flumide, you may start to see some results in the one to two months, but it really takes a while for them to fully kick in. Um, again, there's going to be toxicity associated with these drugs as well, so it's really important to remind your patients that even though you're not seeing benefits now, um, the benefits are long standing and it may take a bit to get there, but uh, compliance is going to be very, very important. Um, the benefit of the biologic DMARDs is since they are 
kind of gener um, they were generated against a specific protein or specific receptor. Um, they're able to target that and bind to it immediately, and so you generally see a lot more um, uh, a lot more quick effects of the biologic DMARDs because they're able to affect those inflammatory cells almost immediately. So you see some benefit within uh, a few weeks. Um, one of the big things is that because these are knocking down your immune system uh, and preventing a lot of your inflammatory cells from working uh, appropriately, it's very important to make sure that we're doing TB testing um, prior to starting these biologic DMARDs. Um, someone may have uh, latent disease, and by knocking down their immune system, all of a sudden this allows um, you know, some latent TB to flare up and become active disease. So it's very, very important to test your patients for TB prior to starting um, one of these biologic DMARDs. So again, going back to methotrexate, um, the mechanism of action, as you guys remember, is it is an analog to folic acid. Uh, it's able to get into a lot of these rapidly dividing cells, like our immune cells, uh, which are overly active in, in RA. Um, and it has a high affinity for dihydrofolate reductase. So by binding to that enzyme, it's able to prevent activation of folic acid um, by preventing um, the conversion of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. And so that becomes very important for the transfer of things like carbon groups and, and the synthesis, synthesis of thymidine, cysteine, and methionine. Um, so again, looking here at this picture, we've seen this before. Um, just to reiterate the point, um, here you have your methotrexate kind of coming in and this follows acid pathway. So it prevents this uh, dihydrofolate reductase from, from reducing this down um, and being able to produce tetrahydrofolate. So by preventing this uh, function from happening, we are able to prevent um, the activity of thymidylate synthase from really uh, occurring, uh, prevents this recycling of folic acid, and this uh, prevents a lot of the um, production of those, um, those base pairs as we saw before. Um, so again, by doing that, you're preventing a lot of these uh, immune cells from reproducing. So you're kind of knocking down the, the, the function of the cells and, and the number of the cells. So similar to how we use methotrexate for um, leukemias, where again, their inflammatory cells, their immune cells are, are far too active and are reproducing at a, at a big rate. Um, methotrexate is basically doing the same thing um, for these overly active inflammatory cells. Um, the toxicity we're going to expect to see with methotrexate is uh, going to include things like bone marrow suppression. You can see GI and oral epithelial ulcerations where you get that stomatitis that can occur. Um, you can also see the rapidly dividing cells of the GI tract being affected as well due to um, causing nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, also, like the hair cells may uh, potentially be affected as well. And some pulmonary effects. The one of the benefits of, um, or one of the, the things to know about methotrexate and rheumatoid arthritis is that typically the doses you're using are much lower than we need for cancer. Um, so because of that, just the number of immune cells it needs to affect is much less. Um, you don't need to use as high doses. So typically your toxicity is going to scale with the dose that you're giving. So by giving much lower doses, this is going to be much less pronounced than you'd see in an oncology patient. Again, uh, methotrexate is one of the more commonly used DMARDs. Uh, it's very effective, fairly rapid of onset of action, so again, within one to two months, um, and a pretty acceptable incidence of adverse effects. Again, lower doses than you see for cancer, and, and there's a number of ways that you can administer it. So it can be given PO, um, it can be given subcutaneously or intramuscularly. Obviously, monitoring is going to include looking at their CBC to look, make sure we're not having um, too much toxicity and knocking down too many of their immune cells, um, looking at their LFTs, and, and due to the potential for um, precipitation of methotrexate out in the, out in the kidneys, um, we're going to be looking at their serum creatinine at baseline. Um, we're going to be measuring these monthly for every, uh, every month for six months, and then you can kind of start to back it out um, as you go along. If the patient is uh, of childbearing potential, then obviously you want to check their pregnancy status as well. One of the things that we're going to do to help kind of salvage um, the other healthy cells in the body is by giving supplemental folic acid, um, either a milligram every day or maybe give seven milligrams once weekly. Again, um, folic acid itself is not able to function in cells where methotrexate is being um, utilized, um, but the idea behind giving this is, is to kind of help supplement the, the other healthy tissue and cells and, and make sure they're not becoming depleted of folic acid. 
Um, next, we have leflunamide. Um, this one specifically is going to be inhibiting uh, pyrimidine synthesis. Um, so we have decreased uh, lymphocyte proliferation. And uh, this one is actually a prodrug that gets broken down within the liver uh, to become activated. So again, the effects we're going to be seeing here are going to be decreased symptoms, decreased inflammation, and hopefully decreased joint damage over time. Um, this one also works fairly quickly, and benefits can be seen within one, one month. Um, efficacy is generally going to be comparable to methotrexate. Um, but again, methotrexate is you know, it's a very old drug. It's been around for a while. has a good safety profile, so oftentimes that's going to be people's go-to. Um, but lithalumide may be a decent alternative if methotrexate is not available or, avail um, or good for that patient. Some of the adverse uh, effects you're going to be able to expect to see very similar to anything else affecting um, dividing cell, rapidly dividing cells. So diarrhea is going to be very common here. Um, and uh, most significantly, you can see potentially hepatotoxicity, uh, immunosuppression, and this hematologic toxicity. This one, again, uh, is going to be teratogenic, as you might imagine. Um, again, fetuses are just big bunches of rapidly dividing cells, so these could be affected just as well. Um, What's interesting here is that it takes a long time for levels to actually drop down to safe, um, drop down to, to negligible levels. And this is because it undergoes this process called enterohepatic recirculation. And essentially what that means is that the drug gets absorbed into the body. Uh, it's going to be eliminated within the bile. And so it'll actually kick it out within the bile salts. Um, but then while it's in the GI tract, part of it's able to be reabsorbed. And so it kind of undergoes this cycle that happens here that allows the drug to stay within the body for a long period of time. So the apparent action, duration of action of the drug is quite long. Um, so because of that, one of the things we can actually potentially do is if you guys remember back to your hyperlipidemia lectures, uh, cholestyramine was a bile acid sequestrant. What this can do is actually bind up those bile salts and prevent the lifalunamide from being reabsorbed. Um, so that can actually enhance the ability to kind of eliminate the drug from the body. Obviously, monitoring is going to be very similar to methotrexate, so you look at your LTs, look at your CBC, and also look for pregnancy um, status as well. The next drug uh, that we'll talk about is going to be hydroxychloroquine. Again, this is another old school traditional DMARD. Um, also considered to be probably the least toxic of the group. Um, also probably the least potent for actually um, slowing progression of the disease in rheumatoid arthritis. So really only for mild disease uh, or maybe in combination with some other types of DMARDs. And we'll talk about combination therapy a little bit later. Uh, one of the mechanisms of uh, hydroxychloroquine is going to help to inhibit neutrophil locomotion. It's also going to help decrease chemotaxis of eosinophils um, and will also work to impair the complement dependent antigen antibody reactions that are happening. And we know that, um, again, the body is producing a lot of these self antigens um, that your antibodies are reacting to. So by slowing this process down, um, you're going to see a uh, basic general decrease in inflammation occurring. Response here is going to be a little bit slower than you would see with um, like leflunamide or methotrexate. So around two to four months or so before you really start to see effects kick in. Um, this one is not associated with um, any significant myelosuppression because again these are not dealing with uh, hydroxychloroquine is not inhibiting the reproductive uh, process or the um, the reproduction of, of immune cells is just simply inhibiting their activity. Um, we also do not see about toxicity with it or any type of renal insufficiency. So because of that, a lot less monitoring associated with it than you would see with methotrexate or leflunamide. Some of the uh, side effects we do see with hydroxychloroquine includes um, GI side effects like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, so therefore, it, it's actually minimized um, by taking it with food. Some other kind of unique things you can see with hydroxychloroquine include retinopathies. Um, so more commonly seen, especially with uh, chronic therapy, is going to include things like blurred vision, scotomas, and accommodation effects. And then uh, from the dermatologic side, you can see rash, alopecia, and actually this um, increased skin pigmentation, as you can see in the in the picture here, um, the kind of increased um, discoloration of the skin that can occur with uh, chronic therapy. Um, next, we also have sulfazalazine. Um, when we talk about potentially other rheumatologic conditions, especially things like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, this one will pop up again. Um, this one, as well as um, 
what we saw with leflunomide is actually a pro drug. So this one is cleaved within the GI tract by colonic bacteria, and it gets turned into sulfapyridine and 5 amino salicylic acid. Um, key piece serving that salicylic acid, so it's actually a derivative of aspirin. The mechanism is really unknown, um, but we do know it helps to modulate inflammatory mediators and works to inhibit the effects of uh, tumor necrosis factor and can work as a free radical scavenger as well. So remember that uh, H2O2 that was being formed um, by uh, all the activity of those T cells and whatnot, um, this is going to help to kind of eliminate some of those free radicals to, to prevent their propagation of um, further cellular damage. Again, this one's going to work a little bit slower, response typically seen within one to four months. Uh, up to 50% of patients will experience some side effects with this, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, rash, elevated LFTs, and alopecia. So the key here is to really start uh, start low on your on your doses and try to go slow and, and see how the patient really tolerates it, um, and try to treat any effects that pop up um, uh, supportively. Rarely you can see some blood dyscrasias like leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, but these are pretty rare. Um, and one of the things here is going to be drug interactions to worry about. So um, you can see some problems with iron supplements um, preventing absorption. Warfarin can cause a problem. Um, that'll be one of the anticoagulants we talk about causing um, uh, issues of protein binding, where warfarin is high protein binding, which can um, disrupt sulfasalazine from binding to proteins like uh, albumin and things like that. Um, and the other thing is going to be uh, antibiotics. So as we said in the last slide, um, that the colonic bacteria are what are activating the drug. Um, normally with a lot of other pro-drugs, you see that the liver um, is going to be the site where a lot of these pro-drugs are activated. But with this, antibiotics are um, going to actually kill off a lot of the colonic bacteria. So if there's no bacteria there, the drugs will become uh, less activated and less effective. Uh, other big things to look for here is it's going to turn the urine and stools um, kind of a yellow to orangish color. And I always say that any drug that's going to be changing the color of a urine stool for a patient, you should probably inform them of. Otherwise, it can lead to some um, uh, pretty freaked out patients. Um, you know, anytime I see kind of a reddish discoloration of the stools, I'm thinking GI bleed. But if you warn them beforehand, um, it can kind of help stave off a lot of that, um, that fear and panic. Um, so that's it for the, uh, the traditional DMARDs. Moving on, next we had the biological agents. So again, these are genetically engineered proteins. Um, again, there are lots of agents here, but the ones that I've highlighted are the ones that I would focus on for studying. Uh, again, these are probably a little bit um, older of the group, uh, so I didn't focus on uh, the newer guys. Um, but here with the TNF alpha blockers, so again, these are specifically designed proteins to bind to TNF alpha. Now we have infliximab, etanercept, and adalimumab, or Humira. Um, again, we also have golimumab and um, sort of lizumab. Uh, but again, these are not highlighted, so I would not focus too much time on these. Um, as far as IL-1 or interleukin-1 uh, receptor antagonists, we have antikinra. And then for IL-6, we have tocilizumab or actimra. Um, looking at some of our other biological agents, we have uh, rituximab, which actually works to deplete peripheral B cells. Again, we saw earlier that B cells are very important for um, activation of uh, the inflammatory cascade uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. And we also have uh, a batacept or Arensia, which will actually end up binding to some of those CD receptors on the T cells, uh, CD80 and 86 specifically. Um, I thought this was kind of a cool picture that kind of uh, gives you a little bit more background on uh, the monoclonal antibodies um, and how they're actually formed. Um, so you'll actually see that depending on how the protein is made and whether or not it's using a humanized protein versus a murine or mouse protein, um, the name will actually reflect that. So um, again, this is probably just nerdy pharmacy uh, uh, trivia, uh, but just for your own um, edification. Um, again, looking here at the uh, top left, you have the pure mouse protein. So this would have an O um, here. If it was a, hum or a, um, a humanized uh, bottom left here, it'd have a zoo. Looking up here, um, if it's chimeric, meaning it has mouse and human protein, this would be XI or XI. So um, like rituximab, this XI in there refers to the fact that it's um, chimeric and then includes both mouse and uh, human protein. The takeaway from that, uh, practically speaking, is that the more 
human looking the protein is, the less likely we are to have um, anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reactions to it. Um, not to say that you wouldn't have any reactions whatsoever because again it is still a foreign protein but again it looks less foreign when it's more humanized than it would be uh, than if it was purely mouse protein. So, so um, with biologic agents um, these are going to be effective in, especially when you have failure of non-biologic DMARD failure. Um, I will tell you that these agents, because they are specifically engineered um, proteins, very, very expensive versus something like methotrexate, which has been around for forever. Um, so because of that, you know, depending on the patient's insurance, um, it might choose, lead you to choose one agent over another. Um, but typically these can be reserved for if there are failure of the traditional DMARDs. Um, most of the time there's very little monitoring associated with these agents because they have a much more kind of specific mechanism of action than you would see with things like methotrexate. You know, methotrexate can affect potentially every cell within the human body um, by interfering with folic acid use. Um, as for these guys though, they're going to be affecting specific targets such as interleukin-1, interleukin-6, they're much more specific so I always think of them as kind of much more like a like a sniper rifle versus the shotgun approach you see with um, some of the old traditional DMARDs. Um, because these are knocking down the immune system we are going to see risk for infection being a possibility here and also we always recommend getting TB testing done before the initiation of therapy as this can these agents can lead to increased risk for um, activation of, of latent TB infections. Um, while the patient has an infection, it's always recommended to discontinue use of these agents because they might not be able to clear the infection as well, could progress, uh, not things we want to see happen to our patients, and we recommend not giving these with live vaccines. Uh, the reason for that is, is if you were to give a live vaccine um, and your immune system is not really up to par because these DMARDs, these biologic DMARDs are um, preventing your immune system from functioning appropriately, um, you may see uh, potentially disease developing from the, from the live vaccine. Because again, um, vaccine is still live bacteria um, or live virus, so again this could lead to um, uh, illness in your patient. Looking at the TNF-alpha inhibitors, so again this is kind of the bigger group here, um, all of them are going to have similar side effects and contraindications. Um, a relative contraindication we're going to see here is uh, for CHF, for congestive heart failure. Um, one thing they did see with infliximab is an increased risk for cardiovascular death. Um, we've also seen cardio, uh, CHF exacerbations with a Tanercept. So what they usually recommend is that if you have an ejection fraction less than 50% or class 3 or 4 heart failure, they recommend avoiding uh, these agents. With MS, or multiple sclerosis, um, we can see that these agents may induce or exacerbate symptoms. So if the symptoms are occurring, they recommend discontinuing um, use of these agents. Uh, and they all, all the TNF-alpha inhibitors have a black box warning of lymphoproliferative cancer. Uh, this could actually uh, make this worse. Or uh, these agents can potentially uh, induce um, lympho lymphoproliferative cancer in, in, in certain patients. Uh, with a Tandercept or Embril, uh, here's a picture of what the, the product looks like. Again, not specifically um, a, uh, an antibody as we would see with some of our other agents. Um, but basically what this is doing to is, is binding and inhibiting TNF-alpha, um, resulting in uh, decreased symptoms and inflammation uh, and, and general joint damage uh, that's occurring. It's actually interesting here is if you look at the... Look at the, the product here. Um, we see that the extracellular domain looks very similar to the TNF receptor. So it's actually designed to look like the receptor for uh, tumor necrosis factor. So it'll actually bind up the endogenous TNF that's being produced by the patient um, and render it ineffective. Um, again, looking at it, it's basically two TNF receptors linked to the FC fragment of an IgG. Um, so again, um, not a full antibody, but very similar looking um, to what you would see with uh, some of the other agents. Um, this one may be used by itself or potentially you could use it in combination um, with methotrexate. Generally considered to be a second line DMARD uh, in general. Uh, 
this one you're going to see that the half-lives of them are fairly long, um, mainly because they're kind of protein-based, stick around for a bit longer than you see with some of these other drugs, um, so you can get away with giving these drugs less often. So this one here would be given subcutaneously twice a week. Um, biggest thing we're going to be seeing here are going to be things like injection site reactions, um, increased risk for infections, as we've mentioned previously, um, and of course this stuff is very expensive, so around $15,000 a year um, for treatment. Uh, with infliximab or Remicade, this one is going to be a chimeric antibody. Again, we talked about that XI being a chimeric um, bit of nomenclature. So it's going to include mouse and human uh, IgG. Uh, this one's going to be binding to and inhibiting TNF-alpha, resulting in, again, decreased symptoms and inflammation and joint damage. Um, again, this is specific for TNF-alpha. So again, it's not going to be affecting a whole lot of other types of, of cellular processes, only TNF. So this one will be indicated for RA patients um, who have received an inadequate response from methotrexate. So again, we're seeing that due to the side effects, um, due to the cost of these agents, they're oftentimes going to be relegated to second-line therapy once the patients have failed therapy with um, one of the more traditional DMARDs. Um, so this one has recently been shown to be safe and effective in combination with leflunamide um, in patients that are unable to tolerate methotrexate. So again, it's another drug we could potentially use this in combination with. Um, one of the things here is that you can actually utilize methotrexate um, in conjunction with infliximab to actually prevent some of this immune reaction to the foreign protein. Um, we see allergic reactions or anaphylactoid and anaphylactic reactions in around 14 to 40 percent of patients receiving infliximab. Um, also see a lot of infusion reactions associated with it, but um, by giving methotrexate you can actually decrease some of that um, response to it. Um, some cases may actually decrease efficacy, but again, um, sometimes it is warranted to give these two together. Um, again, looking at the dosing for infliximab, again, the half-life or relative duration of action is fairly long, so you can give this one, um, uh, you know, give the first dose, and then two weeks later you'll give another dose, and six weeks later, and then eventually you end up giving it um, every eight weeks or so. So again, the half-life being fairly long. Um, this one is infused over two hours. Um, and again, we do see a lot of injection site reactions to this. So again, this is going to be one of those things where you definitely want to have, um, especially with your first dose, you want to have a lot of your uh, anaphylaxis meds available. So um, uh, again, if we were in a live class, this is where I'd ask you, oh, what type of meds would we utilize for uh, an anaphylactic reaction? Um, to which you guys would obviously say, oh, well, you know, we'd start out with something like, you know, uh, I am epinephrine. Uh, we'd also utilize you know, histamines like diphenhydramine and uh, corticosteroids like uh, methylprednisolone or, or hydrocortisone. Um, all these things can be utilized. Um, typically what you'll see, especially if you know a patient um, has a history of injection site reactions, is you can actually pre-treat um, with diphenhydramine, again, the antihistamine um, action it helps to limit some of that kind of wheel and flare and, and all that you see with the, the injection site reactions. Um, again, uh, an, an increased risk of infection is going to be seen with uh, most of these TNF-alpha blockers. Um, infliximab is no, uh, uh, no exception to that. Then we have adalimumab or Humira, um, and, and again, this is a good point to mention that you know a lot of these biologic DMARDs are not specific just to treatment of um, rheumatoid arthritis. Really, a lot of these can be utilized for all sorts of autoimmune conditions. Um, so like adalimumab, uh, we utilize for uh, especially a lot of GI um, conditions of so like you know, Crohn's disease and all sorts of colitis. Um, I see uh, being used for that. Um, again, uh, Humira is going to be a human monoclonal antibody um, specific for TNF-alpha. Again, very similar actions you see with the other agents. Um, again, this one is all human protein, so less allergy risk than you would see with um, infliximab. So again, benefit of this drug. Um, again, this one's going to be utilized as kind of a second line agent once they have um, had inadequate response to at least uh, one other DMARD. Um, and this one is actually approved for monotherapy and rheumatoid arthritis, so not necessarily you need to use in combination with other agents. You can use it just by itself. And this one, again, long half-lives would be given every other week or so. Um, again, what we see are that uh, the adverse effects are very similar as a group. So again, nothing too spectacular to remember as, uh, as a group. No, no uh, kind of one-off drug or uh, adverse reactions to speak of. Most of them are going to act very, very similar 
lead to one another. Uh, and then we have a Batisep Orencia. This one is going to be um, not a TNF alpha blocker, but um, is going to be utilized as a co-stimulation modulator. So basically binding to the CD80 and 86 receptors and preventing interactions between some of these antigen-presenting cells, those APCs, and the T cells. So by, by doing that, basically prevent the T cells from being activated. Um, again, this is going to be more utilized for moderate to severe disease, or severe disease, I guess, in this case, uh, who have failed other therapy. Um, yeah, this is weight-based dosing be given every four weeks um, and can be utilized either by itself or in combination therapy. Um, one of the things they've seen with this one is that about half of the patients who have failed TNF-alpha blockers actually do tend to respond um, to a bad asep. So it could be a potentially a second or a third line agent uh, being utilized. Again, similar, uh, similar adverse reactions including headache, infection risk, uh, injection reactions, and extremity pain. Uh, then you have uh, rituximab or rituxin. Uh, again, this is going to be a chimeric monoclonal antibody, so it's going to have human and mouse protein. So that's going to lead you to believe that um, allergic reactions are going to be a definite possibility. Um, this one is an antibody against a CD20 protein on B lymphocytes. What this does is cause uh, a near complete B cell depletion. And it's also going to be decreasing the number of antigens that are presenting to T cells, again, because the B cells are not going to be able to, to kind of spit those out. Um, what we see is that it takes several months for the B cells to fully recover after, after discontinuation. Um, so, of course, you know, infection risks are going to be huge with this one. Um, this is generally because the effects are a little bit more severe, expect to see more kind of um, significant immunosuppression. Um, definitely going to be utilized for uh, in the case of the failure of methotrexate or the, the TNF alpha blockers. Um, this one is going to be given as two infusions two weeks apart, um, and this one certainly needs to be pre treated and certainly have your anaphylaxis meds available at the bedside uh, in case the patient ends up having a reaction. Um, some cases this one can be utilized with methotrexate, so you know potentially if they had an inadequate response with methotrexate and say a TNF alpha blocker, maybe this one could be utilized as, as a um, alternative to one of those um, other uh, antibodies. We also have tocilizumab or Actimra. This one is going to be a humanized monoclonal antibody against interleukin six. Again, promotes. Um, Interleukin-6 is responsible for promoting a lot of inflammation in RA, um, and so this one can be utilized as a fallback agent after the failure of some of the TNF blockers. Again, similar to what we've seen before, there's some infusion reactions and infection risk, um, but interestingly enough, some of the kind of unique issues uh, we can see here include hyperlipidemia, um, some elevated transaminases, and also the risk for GI perforation. So something kind of unique with this one you don't see with the other agents. Um, another unique thing you can see with this include induction of CYP3A4. Um, so obviously if we're inducing CYP3A4, there's going to be more, uh, more of that enzyme around, and thus it's going to cause more metabolism of drugs affected by that, which means your drugs may potentially be less effective. Could be a problem if you're on warfarin, say, for AFib and you need that to prevent clots. Also, it could be important for birth control if it's not going to be working as effectively. Um, so this is one of those ones where you'd recommend using a backup form of birth control um, in addition to oral contraceptives. And it could also affect things like statins. So if a person who had hyperlipidemia maybe is saying worse, worsened by the Actemra, um, their statins are not going to be working as effectively unless it's one of the ones that were not metabolized by CYP3 or 4. Uh, next we have Anakinra, which is a uh, antibody uh, directed against interleukin-1. Again, um, has a wide range of activities, including um, cartilage degradation. So by preventing activity of this IL-1, you prevent um, further destruction of that cartilage. Uh, and this is going to be recommended for reduction of um, signs and symptoms of moderate to severe disease uh, in patients who have failed kind of other um, DMARDs. Can be utilized either by itself or with other non-biologic DMARDs. And you can see here that um, the dosing is going to be a little more frequent, so subcutaneously every day. Um, again, it's a non-approved abbreviation, so you guys should not be putting that on uh, your slides, but uh, I'll try to get away with it this one time. Um, again, serious adverse drug reactions we can expect to see include things like increased risk of infection and neutropenia. So looking at the biological agents, um, there's an approximately a 30% failure rate um, 
again, this would be uh, considered a primary lack of efficacy if we have failure to see a response in around three to six months. So if you've given the patient the drug for three to six months and they have uh, no remission of symptoms, um, this would be considered a primary lack of efficacy. There's also a secondary lack of efficacy. This could be related to things like um, perhaps maybe some um, increased degradation of the drug or um, changes in uh, the immune cells. Um, but basically, secondary lack of efficacy would be a failure after the initial response. So they get better within that first three to six months. But then efficacy is going to tail, um, trail off over a period of time. And then some patients just have to discontinue therapy due to the adverse effects. Obviously, if they have an anaphylactic reaction uh, to a product, they're not going to be able to continue on that. So switching to another one is, is going to be mandatory. Um, in these cases, you may need to add on a non-biologic DMARD. Um, the idea here is that um, by adding on a non-biologic, you're working with different mechanisms of action, and it may have some synergy um, for uh, the, the biologic product. So um, say you're utilizing a TNF alpha blocker, which is blocking that one specific um, pro-inflammatory cytokine, but then we're adding on, say, methotrexate, which is going to help decrease the proliferation of, uh, of leukocytes. Um, so again, synergy between the mechanisms there. Um, you also may consider, if you have failure of therapy of the biologic products, to actually switch between mechanisms of action. Um, if you have you know, primary lack of efficacy with a TNF-alpha blocker, perhaps TNF-alpha is not really the way to go. Maybe we need to try interleukin blocker or work on uh, the CD20 or CD80 and 86. Um, so try a different mechanism of action as that might lead to better efficacy. One thing we do not recommend is going to be combination of biological therapy. Um, generally, the, the infection risk and, and the anaphylaxis risk and all the other things that go along with that uh, make it so that it's not recommended to combine two biologic therapies. So um, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Some other drugs that will be utilized uh, during rheumatoid arthritis treatment will include things like uh, corticosteroids. Um, we know that these agents have anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive actions. Um, they'll also do things like inhibiting um, the antigen presentation to our T cells. They can inhibit the whole process of um, cytokine production from arachidonic acid, so we'll have less leukotrienes and prostaglandins being produced. They'll also work to inhibit free radical generation and impair cell migration and chemotaxis. So the use of corticosteroids um, couple different ways we can do it. So one um, way would be with uh, chronic therapy. Uh, we know that every other day therapy is not effective, even though this would limit some of the side effects we would see. Um, but typically, everyday therapy, uh, low dose, relatively speaking, um, can be useful to help um, prevent flare-up of symptoms. Um, sometimes we'll use these as bridge, uh, bridge therapy, uh, meaning um, between times, say, starting up a new DMARD, we're giving it say one to two months to really kick in. This can be utilized at higher doses in order to help kind of bridge them until you see activity from uh, the DMARD. Uh, these can also be utilized for disease flare ups. So if they end up having an exacerbation, um, utilizing a higher dose steroid uh, for a short period of time um, can help decrease a lot of that inflammation from occurring. Um, intramuscular is going to be preferred for more short acting uh, for burst therapy. Uh, and there's actually also some long acting depot forms. Uh, we remember that with chronic dosing of corticosteroids, eventually that causes um, your adrenal glands to kind of shut down to some degree because, again, they are getting all the corticosteroids they need, so why do they need to keep producing their own? One of the benefits of using one of these long acting forms is that drug levels naturally taper off at a slow rate. So you end up seeing less uh, adrenal insufficiency secondary to withdrawal. Um, again, so it's kind of doing a natural taper that you would see done with uh, longer courses of oral steroids. There's also the ability to utilize intraarticular injections. Um, these are good if there's a small number of joints involved. Um, it also helps to limit how many um, systemic side effects you're going to be seeing, so fewer adverse drug reactions associated with that um, due to less systemic uh, absorption. And then they recommend no more than two to three administrations in a year because uh, this can actually lead to joint destruction and tendon atrophy.
So with corticosteroids, the lowest dose possible should be used because this is going to help um, limit the number of side effects we're going to be seeing, especially when administered systemically. Um, some of the things we've seen with use uh, includes reducing the rate of radiographic progression, especially in the first few years of use. Um, and we still need some more conclusive data regarding really the efficacy and safety of low-dose corticosteroids for long, long periods of time. But um, for symptom management, it is useful, um, especially if you can use it for chronic low-dose um, therapy. Uh, we know about the adverse effects associated with corticosteroids. This can include things like HPA axis suppression, um, osteoporosis. So again, we always want to make sure we're supplementing calcium and vitamin D. Um, we can see myopathies, cataracts, hirsutism, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia. This will also knock down our immune system, so infection risk is there. Lots and lots of problems are seen with corticosteroids, which is why we want to try to limit the dose as much as possible. And then um, when we're using higher dose uh, pulse therapy, we want to try to limit that to as short a period as possible and, and taper down um, pretty rapidly. Or not taper down rapidly, but try to get them off of it uh, as quickly as, as the disease um, flare-up going away will allow. Um, other things we can utilize for chronic therapy of RA is going to include our NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, Again, these are going to have analgesic activity, antipyretic, and anti-inflammatory actions. Um, again, these are going to be different than uh, working than acetaminophen, as these are going to be better for um, site-specific inflammation. So, you know, if I have a specific joint that's being inflamed, um, this is going to be much better for an NSAID to, to work against rather than something like acetaminophen. Um, so these agents are commonly used as analgesics, um, both over-the-counter and prescription products. Um, and again, they're going to be working by inhibiting cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 enzymes. Uh, especially the non-selective agents, uh, and working to decrease prostaglandin synthesis. Again, looking at this picture here, we saw something very similar before with uh, membrane phospholipids being uh, liberated by phospholipase into arachidonic acid, um, and the um, inside specifically are going to be working on cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 to uh, prevent the production of things like thromboxanes and prostaglandins and in process cyclins all of which will lead to decreased inflammation um, in the joints. So a couple of different agents we can utilize for this. Again, this is not a complete list, but just the ones that I uh, feel are more commonly seen um, that you may be exposed to. So, um, so of course, we'll include aspirin. Again, aspirin is considered an NZ uh, in a lot of ways, even though oftentimes it's um, due to its nature as an irreversible inhibitor of, of platelets oftentimes is um, kind of listed separately because the toxicity is a little different than um, you would see with uh, a lot of the other NSAIDs. But this will include things like ibuprofen, naproxen, indomethacin, um, uh, ketorolac, uh, the actual proper way to say that is ketorolac, but again you sound kind of like a pharmacy nerd if you say that, so I'll just keep saying ketorolac uh, and also tolmetin. Um, there's no specific therapeutic advantage of using one class over another, so as long as the agent's working for your patient, that's the best way to go with. Um, and, and depending on your patient, you may need to utilize different dosage forms. So, um, you know, oral is always uh, available for most of these, but we can see sometimes, especially with like flare ups and things, um, the IV or IM administration is warranted, or even um, rectal suppositories. So um, looking at individual response, um, it can vary, but typically you want to try two to three week trials uh, with different agents. So if it's not working within two to three weeks, then try switching over to something else. Um, looking at the common side effects we're going to be seeing with NSAIDs, uh, this is going to include uh, mostly the actions uh, of decreasing prostaglandin synthesis. So we know that by decreasing um, prostaglandin synthesis, we're decreasing the amount of things like mucus and that basically that whole protective barrier uh, around the stomach. Um, so this is going to cause a uh, risk for gastric and intestinal ulceration. Um, while the patient has the drug in their system, they're going to see decreased platelet aggregation, so bleeding risk is a possibility. And in some rare instances, you may have patients who have hypersensitivity reactions to this, including anaphylaxis and rashes. Um, also, uh, as we have kind of looked at before, their pregnancy status, um, this can actually have prolonged gestation um, for your pregnant patients, uh, which is kind of why it gets a, a D category in later pregnancy. Um, this may actually delay spontaneous labor, and you can actually see adverse fetal effects as well. Um, prostaglandins are necessary to keep the, the ductus arteriosus open in, in fetuses, uh, and by administering this, you may actually close that off prematurely and cause um, 
different um, circulation issues for the baby. Um, due to the fact that when we're giving um, NSAIDs and they are blocking the effects of cyclooxygenase, you have a, a shunting of, of the pathway from um, more prostaglandin synthesis to more lipoxygenase activity and more leukotriene synthesis. And so because we know leukotrienes can induce bronchospasm, especially in those sensitive asthmatics, um, this is a common, um, or not a common, but is a potential side effect um, uh, for those patients who you know, have a... Um, who have asthma, uh, if you ever see them with an ibuprofen allergy, it could be related to that. Um, we also have the potential for hepatotoxicity and potentially even decreased renal function. Talked about this a lot during the um, hypertension lectures, but again, this is all related to decreasing prostaglandins that are involved in the normal kind of renal control mechanisms. Again, those, um, those uh, afferent arterials going into the kidneys. Um, by having the prostaglandins uh, being uh, reduced, you're going to have more vasoconstriction on those uh, and those decreased renal blood flow. Looking at salicylate specifically, um, again, acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin um, has a good oral absorption, uh, basically uh, hepatically metabolized and renally excreted. Um, you know, it is able to cross the placenta and the breast milk. Um, its activity here is what you're going to see is that it has irreversible, non competitive activity against the platelets, uh, which is why this is going to carry more bleeding risk associated with it than um, uh, our NSAIDs. Again, this one is a non selective cyclooxygenase inhibitor, so it's going to be affecting COX 1, 2, and 3 relatively equally. Again, we remember um, that you know COX-1 is going to be our uh, constitutive cyclooxygenase, so usually it's around 24-7. Uh, COX-2 is going to be one of our um, inducible cyclooxygenase enzymes uh, there when inflammation is occurring. And then COX-3 is much more of a kind of centrally acting CNS cyclooxygenase. Uh, contraindications to receiving salicylates would include things like uh, they already have a bleeding disorder, um, Pregnancy, again, um, in some cases it might be warranted, especially with preeclampsia, but um, generally should be avoided. Uh, and then, of course, should be uh, avoided in children, especially less than 16, especially after a viral illness, uh, because they do have an increased risk of Ray syndrome. Um, looking at the different classes of NSAIDs, uh, one of them would be the propionic acid derivatives. Again, these are going to be uh, well absorbed orally. They have good uh, high protein binding uh, and are generally more potent than some of your other um, agents in the NSAID class. Uh, again, metabolized in the liver and then uh, excreted renally. Uh, and they all have very similar therapeutic actions. Um, again, non specific um, inhibition of uh, cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Um, generally, these agents are going to have less severe GI effects, um, but they can have more severe renal and hepatotoxicity. Um, obviously, its main uses are going to be things like arthritis, muscle pain, and dysmenorrhea. Looking at the agents that fall into the propionic acid derivatives, we would see things like our ibuprofen, our naproxen, ketoprofen, um, oxaprozin, all these things. Um, noticing the half-life is going to be different depending on the agent you're talking about. Um, especially with something like oxaprozin or Daypro having a very long half-life, necessitating maybe only giving it once a day versus something else like, um, you know, naproxen, uh, otherwise known as Aleve, you know, they say, you know, all day strong, all day long, because it has a longer half-life. So maybe you'll have to give it once a day versus something like ibuprofen, which has a relatively short half-life, you're giving that once a three, four times a day. Um, you also have Ketorolac or Toradol, as this um, brand name is known as. Um, again, this is a slowly reversible non-competitive agent, um, mainly used parenterally, um, especially with things like post-operative pain. Um, and it has pretty similar activity even in reducing pain as, as opiates. So it's a very potent um, NSAID, mainly utilized for like acute flare-ups and things like that. Um, not so good as an anti-inflammatory, but certainly good as an analgesic. Um, does have a few less uh, GI side effects. Um, can see some bleeding risk, but typically we leave it um, at a max of five days of use. So really this is going to be more limited to flare-ups rather than chronic therapy. Uh, next we have um, meloxicam or Mobic. This one um, was approved relatively recently. Um, you know, 2002 is a long time ago for some of you guys, um, but um, more recently than you see with a lot of these other agents. But um, 
essentially this one ends up having kind of a tenfold selectivity for cyclooxygenase 2 over um, COX-1. Uh, so because of that, we'll see less GI toxicity associated with it. And we'll, we'll talk more about um, um, cyclooxygenase selectivity in just a minute. We also have nebumetone, uh, orelafin. This one is actually a prodrug um, and has some active metabolites. Um, this one has a little bit of COX-2 selectivity um, and really has its mainstay of therapy in, in rheumatoid osteoarthritis. Again, similar side effects you might see with some of the other NSAIDs, you know, stomach cramps and, and diarrhea can be possible. Uh, we also have diclofenac or Voltaren. Um, this one's actually kind of nice because it actually has a um, topical formulation available. It comes with a topical gel, which can be administered um, directly to any uh, joints that are being affected. Um, again, this one has some COX-2 selectivity over COX-1, um, but not nearly as much as you see some, some of these other agents. Um, especially when given orally, you're going to see that a fair number of patients are going to have side effects, about one in five. Um, you're going to see a little bit more pronounced GI problems here. So bleeding and ulcerations are typically, um, or can be possible. So looking specifically at COX-2 inhibitors, what I mean by that is that they are NSAIDs that are specifically targeted, um, or more specifically targeted against cyclooxygenase 2 versus 1, is that you see similar efficacy to the other NSAIDs, or the non-selective NSAIDs, but the nice thing here is because it's not affecting the constitutive um, COX-1, which is necessary for things like um, protection of the stomach and, and things like that, um, you see much less GI adverse events, less risk for ulceration and things like that problem was is that when you got too selective for COX-2, um, there was some concerns about um, cardiovascular safety. And so especially with uh, rofecoxib and valdecoxib, um, these were actually removed from the market due to an increased incidence of heart attack and stroke associated with their use. Um, one of the few agents we have that still has some relative um, affinity for COX-2, celecoxib or celebrex, um, has apparently neutral effects on cardiovascular uh, death risk, so that one still remains on the market. But I will tell you that it has much less selectivity for COX-2 than um, either rofecoxib or valdecoxib ever did. So looking at the uh, COX-2 selective agents, again, these are going to be reversible agents. Um, they just happen to have a higher affinity for COX-2 than COX-1. Um, again, mainly going to be affecting inflammation, um, which is you know beneficial for patients like with rheumatoid arthritis. But um, again, we were really worried about some of the cardiovascular death risk associated with it. Um, so that's why uh, rofecoxib and valdecox were both removed. Um, the one I would mainly focus your attention on would be celecoxib or celebrax because that one is still available and on the market. The main benefit from these agents is they're going to limit a lot of the GI side effects. So especially if you had a patient who has a history of GI ulceration, these would be more the agents you'd want to focus on rather than um, a more non-selective NSAID. Looking at the selectivity of these agents, we saw that um, both valdecoxib and rofecoxib were fairly, fairly specific for um, COX-2, um, whereas salicoxib was much, much less specific. Um, but again, keep in mind that, you know, um, Enzyme specificity um, is all relative, especially compared to your dose. But Celebrex is, is has some slight COX-2 uh, affinity, but not nearly as much as some of these other agents did. So the main toxicity that they were concerned with, uh, and the reason why the, the cardiovascular death risk was there, is because mainly by focusing on COX-2, which again is that can uh, that inducible cyclooxygenase, you're inhibiting a lot of production of prostacyclin or PGI-2. Um, you're producing um, much more thromboxane uh, A2, and this was leading to much more production in things like the epithelial cells and blood vessels. Um, so what was happening by causing this imbalance is you're actually increasing the risk for myocardial infarctions, strokes. We saw increases in blood pressure and decreases in kidney function. So because of that, um, that theoretical mechanism there um, and the fact that we did see increased deaths in some of these big studies, uh, a lot of the agents were taken off the market. Um, other things you might be able to see with these agents include things like skin reactions, hypersensitivity, but um, not anything too too crazy there. So basically the, the bottom line for NSAIDs is there are lots of agents out there and they're very useful as adjunctive treatment to analgesics and um, osteoarthritis or they can be used by themselves. Um, and they're really going to be seen as a mainstay of chronic therapy in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they're not going to have any effect on modifying the disease progression. That's really going to be relegated to those DMARDs that we talked about previously um, that do help with acute symptoms. Um, 
you've got to make sure we're using an adequate dose. Try to use as low a dose as possible to prevent toxicity um, and, and make sure we're giving a, these agents a fair shake. Um, because of the, the fact that patients are going to have variable responses to it, the, the general approach would be to use um, one class of agents, you know, for two to three weeks if you don't have any benefits and try switching over to something else. Um, you know, so if um, ibuprofen doesn't work for your patient, maybe try switching over to um, a different class or different agent within the, uh, the group in order to see how they uh, work to that. So again, patients are going to respond differently to different drugs. Um, looking here, there's no evidence to really support a combination of NSAID use um, uh, plus aspirin or to use different NSAIDs at the same time. So really one NSAID should be fine. Uh, the one exception to this would be low-dose aspirin utilized for cardiovascular protection. Um, that one's okay. So, you know, an 81 milligram aspirin is fine on top of your NSAIDs. The risk for toxicity there is relatively low. Um, again, the COX-2 inhibitors are going to be similar to a lot of your NSAIDs, but these are going to be mainly utilized for your more high-risk patients, especially your high-risk um, GI patients. Um, so again, kind of comparing these, um, if they have a low risk for GI complications, it's recommended just to use an NSAID. If they have high risk for GI, uh, or GI complications, it's uh, recommended to use an NSAID plus some sort of gastroprotective agent. So either um, like a proton pump inhibitor would be probably one of the better agents here. Um, or you can consider using a COX-2 inhibitor if they have low cardiovascular risk. And then if they have high risk for cardiovascular disease, just use an NSAID if necessary. So looking at um, kind of an algorithm for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, um, again, once we have our diagnosis, once we've kind of established our baselines, um, the initial therapy is, again, looking at PT and OT. And then within three months, you typically want to start one of our disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So uh, if they're having severe RA, we could try utilizing uh, methotrexate alone or uh, with another traditional DMARD. For mild RA, you could potentially get away with just utilizing hydroxychloroquine or sulfasalazine. Again, these take longer to work and are generally less effective, but will also have less side effects associated with it. Um, certainly for mild RA, you can consider using an NSAID, but for more severe disease, um, definitely utilize an NSAID to help deal with some of those symptoms. Um, and then consider using a local or low dose steroid. Um, so either something like prednisone, again, these are fairly low doses, only three to five milligrams a day. Um, you know, typically for asthma, you'd use up to, let's say, 60 milligrams a day, so pretty, pretty low doses. Um, for more severe disease, you can bump that up, um, say, maybe 5 to 15. You know, don't memorize the doses, just realize that we're utilizing um, as low a dose of steroids as possible to help manage uh, these disease symptoms. Um, again, looking at the disease activity, they have a poor prognosis. Um, let me get my handy laser pointer out here. Um, look at the disease activity. If they have um, you know, low disease activity and they do not have a poor prognosis, and again, we're going to utilize some of the hydroxychloroquine. We didn't really mention minocycline. Um, that's probably used less often uh, than hydroxychloroquine would. They do have a relatively poor prognosis. Um, this is where we're going to see more of our heavy duty uh, DMARDs, um, like our methotrexate and leflunamide, um, potentially sulfasalazine, or uh, use a combination um, DMARD. So you could potentially utilize um, either combination of um, traditional agents or utilize a, a um, biologic agent with a, a traditional. If they have high disease activity and they do not have um, poor prognosis is where you can utilize things like your methotrexate and leflunamide. Um, if you are dealing with someone who has a high disease activity with uh, poor prognosis, then you can consider either doing combination um, DMARDs or incorporating a TNF-alpha inhibitor um, with or without methotrexate. So looking at this, um, again, looking at disease activity, if they have low disease activity, you've started them on a non-biologic DMARD, um, again, having poor response, the next thing you would do in your step of therapy would either use combination non-biologic therapy of DMARDs or uh, an anti-TNF uh, blocker or just an anti-TNF agent. Um, with high disease activity, again, looking at uh, whether or not they have a poor prognosis. If no, again, we're going to start with a non-biologic DMARD, and if they have poor response, then at that point we can actually um, add on an anti-TNF or combination non-biologic therapy. 
On the other hand, if they did have a poor uh, prognosis and we started them off on one of these agents, they had poor response, that's when we could start to consider using another, um, incorporating an anti-TNF they had not been on one previously. Or this is when we start to kind of uh, up the ante a little bit and start adding on things like rituximab or abatacep. So really it's kind of a stepwise approach where you try to utilize um, your, your non-biologic DMARDs first. Those fail, then you can add on combination therapy or add on a TNF blocker. Uh, and if those TNF blockers are failing, that's where we kind of move back to our, um, our rituximabs and our abatiseps and things like that. Looking at our um, combination therapy, the things that make sense versus the things that don't make sense. Um, with traditional DMARDs, methotrexate oftentimes serves as the backbone uh, for this because, again, it has kind of the most... Um, efficacy associated with it. So it's not uncommon to see things like methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine being used in combination or sulfasalazine or even rarely you might see methotrexate plus hydroxychloroquine plus sulfasalazine. You know regimens like that were probably used more often when you had um, you know before the biologic products came out. Um, we typically do not use methotrexate and leflunamide together because there's actually increased risk of hepatotoxicity so this combination is generally going to be avoided. Looking at your combination therapy of traditional plus um, biologic, uh, most often you're going to see methotrexate kind of serving as the backbone uh, with a uh, biologic being utilized as an add-on, um, such that they failed uh, therapy alone. Um, but these make more sense to do a, a biologic plus a traditional because you know you're kind of going with two different mechanisms of action. Um, you can have one drug working on the, the folic acid cycle, whereas you have another drug working, say, against TNF-alpha or um, interleukin, things like that. Um, things you would not want to do, though, would be to combine two biologic products. Um, again, the immunosuppression risk is, is pretty significant, especially uh, risk for infections developing. Um, and then also you certainly wouldn't want to consider you know two TNF-alpha blockers because you don't really get any extra bang for your buck. Um, those agents are pretty potent as it is. Um, next, we have acetaminophen, um, again, oftentimes abbreviated as APAP. Um, again, this is mainly going to be seen uh, utilized in more um, osteoarthritis. Uh, it's a very good initial choice for analgesia and osteoarthritis because they don't have, it doesn't have as much toxicity as you would see with um, NSAIDs, specific, uh, specifically from a uh, GI standpoint, also from a renal standpoint. Um, Oftentimes we recommend treating with a scheduled therapy. So again, you're utilizing acetaminophen every six hours or every eight hours. You know, um, and it's pretty much relatively safe. Um, the only time you run into issues is if it's being utilized um, in too large a dose for long periods of time. Um, that's where you start to worry about things like hepatotoxicity, which can be kind of synergistic with uh, warfarin toxicity as well. So um, those would be the big things to, to watch out for. And, and there's also some topical analgesics as well. So again, um, topical NSAIDs can be utilized as first-line therapy for um, knee osteoarthritis, especially if acetaminophen has failed. Um, and it's generally going to be preferred over oral NSAIDs, especially for those older patients, more than 75 years of age, um, because it really um, has very limited systemic absorption, so you don't have to worry about so much of the kidney effects or, or the cardiac effects, or I'm sorry, the GI effects. Um, Again, Ticlofenac would be uh, a good option here, Volterin gel, uh, which is a, a prescription product. And there's also um, some salicylate-based products like Asper cream. Some other topical analgesics can be utilized for things like osteoarthritis would be capsaicin. Um, again, this is applied two to four times daily. Um, this one's kind of interesting because it works um, after several weeks. Uh, it really requires consistent application. Like The, the patients need to be really um, vigilant with this are really diligent with this um, and it works by kind of signaling the nerve endings to start to release um, substance P which is really important for nociception over time by um, consistently giving it uh, you're going to be depleting locally the that substance P unless the pain is going to be less um, less effect or less noticeable to the patient um, because the transmission is not happening as well um, found to be very, very effective, but the problem is that patients are very unlikely to actually stick to it and do it uh, appropriately. Um, so it typically can be utilized as, as a adjunct to other analgesics and, and NSAIDs. Um, capsaicin, I will tell you though, always educate your patients to wash their hands, um, soap and water, 
Um, if that stuff gets into uh, gets in contact with any mucous membranes, like your mouth, your eyes, your nose, um, they are going to be feeling it, and they're going to be hurting pretty bad. Um, there's also things like counter irritants. Um, this would include things like menthol, camphor, oil of wintergreen. Um, basically, by creating kind of a cold heat over the, the sore surface, it actually can kind of draw uh, a lot of that pain. Um, uh, similar to how you use the things like Bengay and things like that for, for muscle aches. Uh, and then we can also utilize intra-articular corticosteroids. Um, so this can be an alternative first-line therapy for knee or hip osteoarthritis uh, if they're not able to be controlled by things like NSAIDs or, or acetaminophen. Um, generally, not to be administered more than every three months, as we see uh, saw with the RA, um, can cause increased uh, joint destruction and, and tendon atrophy if used too frequently um, throughout the year. And then opioids, these are going to be really second-line agents. Um, they're good for short-term therapy, so if you have like an acute flare-up, um, they're very useful for that. But really long-term treatment is not recommended. We'll talk more about this when we get to the uh, orthopedic section. Um, so um, just kind of have that in, in the back of your mind that for OA, this would be uh, good for acute flare-ups, but not for a chronic therapy. Um, some other agents that can be utilized in treatment for osteoarthritis include glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, this is a dietary supplement, but it has a relatively decent amount of um, trials um, evidence behind it. Um, we know these products are found in cartilage and synovial fluid, um, and the idea here is that they're going to help to increase proteoglycan synthesis in the articular cartilage, um, hoping to repair some of that cartilage and prevent further breakdown. Um, so it's actually had some studies that have shown moderate effects on improving OA symptoms. Um, uh, so it's definitely not something, um, definitely something to consider for your patients, especially if it can help to um, prevent some of the progression of disease. Um, relatively safe. Uh, most of the studies have only been done in knee osteoarthritis, but that's not to say that it couldn't be generalizable to other joints. Um, and then... Um, Again, the, the American College of Rheumatology and Osteoarthritis, they don't make any specific recommendations to utilize it, but they don't also say not to use it. So, you know, if, you're, if your patient's kind of into it, um, it's certainly um, reasonable to, uh, to try. Um, again, it is a dietary supplement, so brands are going to vary by, um, or products are going to vary by brand. Um, so it's important to find one they like and be consistent with it because, um, between products, you know, there's not a whole lot of good manufacturing practices, so it's not to say that, you know, one product could have, you know, 550 milligrams uh, in, a, in an advertised 500 milligram capsule, whereas another one may only have 400, so. Um, these products are also made from actual ground up um, um, seashells and things like that, so um, if the patients have uh, shellfish allergy, um, this could be a trigger for them. And then um, there's also hyaluronic injections. Um, so these would be intra-articular injections utilized for pain uh, associated with OA of the knee. Um, Hyaluronic is a constituent of the uh, synovial fluid. It also has some anti-inflammatory properties. So it's been seen to have um, good effects in reducing pain and improving joint mobility. Um, and this was, was actually given once a week uh, for about three to five weeks or so. And as far as we know, it's relatively free of side effects um, besides just you know, local injection site pain. Um, so this could be a, a potential use for your patients with uh, knee osteoarthritis. Looking at um, kind of algorithms for treatment of hip and knee osteoarthritis, uh, again, once you determine that your patient um, requires um, pharmacologic therapy, you look at is acetaminophen contraindicated. You know, things like this would be, um, you know, significant hepato dam uh, hepatic damage, um, so cirrhosis and things like that would preclude them from getting it. But this is a good initial therapy. So again, uh, acetaminophen, usually maximum around 4 grams a day. If they are not able to receive acetaminophen, and this is where you want to try utilizing things like topical NSAIDs, especially for the knee, uh, if those are the only ones that are affected, and or intraarticular corticosteroids, um, and then potentially even like something like tramadol, which is actually probably kind of going out of vogue now since it's been reclassified as a narcotic substance. Um, again, we'll talk more about that when we get to the orthopedic section. Um, and then um, oral NSAIDs as well, especially if they have low cardiovascular and GI risk and if they're less than 75 years of age. So um, if treatment is effective, then just continue on what they're doing. And if not, that's when you have to start to go down to second line agents. So this is where I consider either surgery, 
um, uh, intraarticular hyaluronates, opioid analgesics, which again we don't really prefer except for short courses. Um, and in some cases, they've actually even tried something like duloxetine, which we'll talk about a little bit during our behavioral health section, but this is actually um, a selective uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It has been seen to have some benefit in helping with some of the um, pain associated with knee osteoarthritis. For hand osteoarthritis, again, um, the therapy is going to be somewhat similar. Um, first, you kind of stratify as your patient greater than 75 years of age. If no, you can utilize things like oral NSAIDs, especially if they have low cardiovascular and GI risk, um, or things like topical NSAIDs or topical capsaicin. Notice here that the topical products are going to help to limit the systemic side effects we're going to see with these things. Um, if they are greater than 75 years of age, and then you know, try to focus mainly on topical products uh, when possible. Uh, if the treatment is effective, of course, continue treatment. And if not, that's when we have to start considering going down the pathway of looking at combined therapy with, say, two first-line agents, um, uh, or utilize, say, uh, oral agents and topical agents as alternatives. Um, so that's it for this section, uh, talking about rheumatology, um, uh, the first part, um, we'll can pick this up on Tuesday with Rheumatology Part 2. Uh, if you guys have any questions in the meantime, please email me, and I will see you next time.